currently at, a member at the IAS, uh, and received her PhD from Princeton, and then was an NSF postdoc at MIT, and then an NSF slash MIT at uh, Columbia. And she's going to tell us today about homology spheres, not some Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. In low dimensional topology, one of the fundamental goals is to classify manifolds, which are topological spaces that locally look like Euclidean space or Rn. So in dimension one, we have a circle or a one dimensional sphere. So this is the only closed one dimensional manifold that's closed and orientable, and closed means compact without boundary. And throughout this talk, all of my manifolds will be compact and orientable. In dimension two, the classification problem was well understood by the 19th century. We have a two-dimensional sphere. The surface of a donut or a torus and higher genus surfaces. Where G, the genus, is the number of holes. of the surface, sigma g. In dimension three, the story becomes much more complicated and much more interesting. Some of the tools available to us come from algebraic topology. So for example, given any manifold M, we can assign to it a sequence of abelian groups, but the homology They're denoted hi of m, where i is between zero and the dimension of the manifold. And throughout this talk, I work with homology with integer coefficients. Let me give you an example. h1 of sigma g, the genus g surface, is 2g copies of the integers. Intuitively, HI is measuring the existence of holes in dimension I plus 1. So H1 of sigma 1, the torus, is two copies of the integers because there's one two-dimensional hole coming from this direction and another two-dimensional hole coming from this other direction. As another example, let me write down the homology groups associated to an n-dimensional sphere, Sn. So this is a set of points in Rn plus 1 of distance 1 away from the origin. And the homology groups are z in dimensions i equals 0 and n, and 0 in other degrees i. So for the case of two-dimensional surfaces, the homology was a strong enough invariant to tell us which surface we were looking at. It told us exactly which genus surface we were looking at. And it's a natural question to ask how strong of an invariant is homology in higher dimensions. So in dimension three, how strong of an invariant is homology. For example, if y is a homology three sphere, in other words, y is a three manifold with the same homology group as S3, the three sphere, is y the same as S3, where by the same I mean homeomorphic. So this was a question asked a long time ago, and in a 1900 paper by Poincaré, Poincaré answered this question with a yes. And just four years later, in 1904, 
Poincaré wrote another paper saying that the answer was no. <laughs> So in the 1904 paper, Poincaré produced the first example of a three-manifold P such that the homology of P was the same as the homology of S3. the manifold is homeomorphic to the zero locus of x squared plus y cubed plus z to the fifth equals zero, intersected with a five-dimensional sphere in C3. Poincaré was able to distinguish this three-manifold from actually being S3 by the simple idea of the fundamental group. So the observation is that on a sphere, every loop can be continuously deformed to a constant loop or a point. And we say that pi one of a sphere is trivial. Whereas the fundamental group pi one of the Poincaré homology sphere is non-trivial. It's a free group on two generators, x, y, with two relations. So at the end of his 1904 paper, Poincaré asked a question which became known as the Poincaré conjecture. is a homology three sphere with trivial fundamental group, then Y is homeomorphic to S3. And one can generalize this conjecture to be a conjecture about n-dimensional homology spheres. In which case it says that if y is a homology n-sphere with trivial fundamental group, then y is homeomorphic to Sn. And it took a lot of work on this conjecture. This conjecture was a big open problem in the field of topology since it was posed in 1904, um, and it drove a lot of progress in the field. And it took nearly a century and, two, and three fields medals in order for it to be solved. dimension n, dimensions 1 and 2 are trivial, and the first cases for the conjecture to be solved were in the high dimensions. This was done in 1960 by Snell for n bigger than or equal to 5. In 1982, Friedman solved the n equals 4 case, and in 2003, Perlman saw the n equals 3 case, the original point rate conjecture. So it's a general phenomenon that happens in topology that sometimes the higher dimensional pieces can be harder, can be easier to solve than the lower dimensional pieces of 3 and 4. And we'll see more examples of that later in this talk. So 
now that we understand the classification of homology three spheres with trivial fundamental group, we can go back and ask how many homology three spheres there are in general. And the first version of this question I'll ask is how many homology three spheres are there up to homeomorphism? And it turns out that there are lots of examples of homology three spheres up to homeomorphism. For example, the point gray homology sphere sits inside of a whole family of homology spheres called the degree score. And homology spheres. These are denoted by sigma PQR, where PQ and R are relatively co-prime integers. And sigma PQR is defined as the zero of this of the polynomial x to the p plus y to the q plus e to the r equals zero, intersected with s5 and c3. And the point gray sphere was sigma 235. We can construct even more examples of homology three spheres by construction, which begins with a naught in s3 or not in R3. So I can take a knot which lives inside three-dimensional space R3 and I can add to R3 a point at infinity and it becomes S3. And I can do a construction called surgery along the knot K. And I'll end up with a three manifold, in fact, a whole family of three manifolds that are homology three spheres, one for each integer Q. So S3 of K with this coefficient one over Q uh, will represent for me a homology three sphere. And the way that the construction works is by taking a knot in S3 and deleting a tubular neighborhood of that knot from S3. Now what I have left is a three manifold with boundary, and its boundary is a torus. What I've deleted is a copy of a solid torus, and if I include that solid torus back in exactly how it was sitting before, I would end up with S3 again. But if I glue the solid torus in via a map on the boundary torus that identifies this boundary torus to this boundary torus via some interesting way, I'll end up with a different three model. And depending on how I glue, I'll end up with a homology sphere. And there's a whole integer's worth of choices of how to glue so that I end up with a homology sphere.
And I can construct even more examples of homology spheres by starting with two homology spheres and building a third one via an operation called the connected sum. And this dimension has an analog. This operation of connected sum has an analog in dimension two. I can take the connected sum of two surfaces as follows. What I'm doing is I'm taking the disjoint union of this these two surfaces, and I'll delete a copy of a disk from each surface, and then I'll glue along the boundary, and I'll end up with a closed two-dimensional surface, which is the connected sum. For three dimensions, I take the disjoint union of y1 and y2, and I want to delete a copy of a three-dimensional ball from each of the three manifolds and then glue along the boundary spheres. And I'll end up with a closed three-manifold that connected to them. So there are lots of examples of homology three spheres up to homeomorphism. What we can do next is refine this question and ask how many homology three spheres are there up to a weaker equivalence relation? Called homology cobordism. Where this is a weaker equivalence relation in the sense that homeomorphic three manifolds will be homology cobordism. And the definition of homology cobordism, if I have two homology three spheres, y1 and y2, then I say that they're homology cobordant if there exists a four-dimensional manifold w W is called a cobordism because the boundary of W is Y1 union Y2, or the Y1 union, the orientation reverse of Y2. And we say that W is a homology cobordism if the homology of W is isomorphic to the homology of each of the boundary three manifolds, and the isomorphism is induced by the inclusion of each boundary three manifold into the four manifold. In other words, if I'm starting with a homology, if I'm starting with two homology three spheres, then W is a homology cobordism between them, if W is a homology cylinder or a homology S3 times an interval. And so for example, the Greece corn sphere sigma 3, 4, 5 is homology coordinate to S3. So we 
we say that the homology word is improved is defined to be the set of oriented homology three spheres modulo homology chordism. And we denote this group by theta three. This theta three is an abelian group and the operation is connected sum. The cost of S3 is the identity of the group and inverses are given by reversing the orientation of the three molecules. So, one interesting remark is that one can define a generalized version of theta 3. So, theta n is the group of homology n spheres modulo n plus 1 dimensional homology chordism. And the interesting remark is that if you look at this group in the PL category, piecewise linear homology spheres, and this group is trivial for all n not equal to 3, and this is due to Kerber. For us, theta 3 PL is the same as theta 3 smooth. In other words, I can work with smooth homology 3 spheres and smooth homology organisms. And the point is that if I look at the analog of theta 3, in the n-dimensional cases, I end up with a trivial group, which means that theta 3 is measuring something very special about three and four-dimensional topology. that tells us that theta 3 is non-trivial is due to Roquelin in the 1950s. Roquelin constructed a surjective homomorphism new from theta 3 Z mod 2. And in particular, this is the first result that tells us that theta 3 is non trivial as a group. For example, the Roquelin invariant of S3 is 0, but the Roquelin invariant of the Poincare homology sphere is 1 mod 2. And for a long time after Roquelin's result, this was the only result known about the homology cohortism group. And it was even conjectured in the 1970s that maybe the Roquelin homomorphism was in fact an isomorphism and that theta 3 might be just C2 as a group. Um, but with the invention, invention of gauge theory in the 1980s, we learned that theta 3 was in fact a much larger. know that theta 3 is infinite, 
this is due to Kim Tushul and Stern in 85. We also know that theta of 3 is infinitely generated. Again, due to Pontitual Stern and also independently Peruda in 1990. And in particular, they showed that Z infinity is a subgroup of theta 3. And in terms of the structure of theta 3 as a group, we also know that theta 3 contains a Z summand. This is due to Fushov in 2002. And one open question that remained was the existence of torsion in theta 3. So it was a question whether there were examples of two torsion in theta 3 coming from elements that hit the Zima 2 factor in the Ropian homomorphism. And in fact, Manolescu showed that this is not possible. In 2016, showed that there are no elements in theta 3 with Roclean invariance 1 mod 2 such that y is of order 2. And this theorem is significant because it's also related to a problem in classical topology, the problem of existence of triangulations on manifolds. So due to work of Lewski, Stern, and Matsumoto in the 1970s, Matalowski's theorem is equivalent to the statement that in dim dimensions n bigger than or equal to 5, there exists topological manifolds of dimension n that are not triangulable. Where by triangulable, I mean a homeomorphism to a simplicial complex. In other words, Manolescu's theorem disproved the triangulation conjecture in dimensions bigger than or equal to 5. Going back to these three results, it was known that theta 3 contains Z infinity as a subgroup, and it was known that theta 3 contains Z as a summand, and it had been asked for a long time whether theta 3 contains a Z infinity summand. And in joint work from 2018, we answered that theta 3, in fact, does contain an infinite rank sum n. So with Irving Dai, Jen Hong, and Matt Stoffigan, we prove theta 3 contains the Z 
the infinity summand. And our infinite rank summand is generated by three squared spheres, sigma 2i plus 1, 4i plus 1, and 4i plus 3. For i figure they're equal to 1. So whereas the previous results were proven using gauge theory, our theorem is proven using an invariant called hager floer homology. So this is an invariant which assigns to a three manifold a chain complex denoted by CF minus of Y and this is a chain complex over a polynomial ring in one variable U over the field of two elements. This chain complex is an invariant of the three manifold Y up to chain homotopy. And the construction is due to Oshroff and Savo in the early 2000s. And the definition of Hager floor homology involves a technique in symplectic geometry called Lagrangian floor homology. Our proof also uses some extra data on the hager floor chain complex in the form of a map, which is an involution up to homotopy. So this map is called iota, and iota is a map from CF minus of y to CF minus of y, such that iota squared is chain homotopic to the identity. And the construction of this map is due to Hendricks and Manuel's view. So by studying the pair of the chain complex CF minus of Y together with this map iota, we are able to extract an infinite family of homomorphisms. For every j a natural number, there exists a surjective homomorphism of Vj from theta 3 to the integers. Such that if you rally Vj on the three squared sphere, sigma 2i plus 1, 4i plus 1, and 4i plus 3, we'll get the quantity of delta. So if we consider the whole family of maps Vj from j equals 1 to infinity will get a surjective homomorphism from theta 3 to z to the infinity, which gives us our main result. questions that remain about this group theta 3. For example, there are no known elements that of torsion of any order. And more generally, we just like to understand what exactly is this group theta 3. Is it possibly z infinity or is it z infinity plus some something else? So now I'd like to transition to talk about a related question, the question of embedding 
one manifold into a three manifold. So if I fix my three manifold to be F3, then I'm asking about knots. So I can ask how many knots in S3 are there? And this is a question that's very tied to three-dimensional topology. We saw earlier that we can construct three manifolds by starting with a knot via an operation called surgery. And it's true that in general, given any three manifold, you can construct it via a sequence of surgeries and a sequence of knots. So understanding knots gives us a way to understand three manifolds. So we can ask how many knots in S3 are there and the first version of this question is up to isotopy, where by isotopy I am allowing me to deform the knot and bend the knot around in space, but I'm not allowed to cut it at any time. So these two knots are isotopic to each other. We can also ask how many knots are there up to a weaker equivalence relation of concordance, where two isotopic knots will be concordant. And concordance between two knots is an equivalence relation defined as follows. K1 and K2 are concordant if there exists a smoothly embedded annulus S1 times an interval into S3 times an interval. That co-bounds the two knots. In other words, I have a picture like this occurring, where K1 is my first knot, which lives inside of S3 times 0, and K2 lives inside of S3 times 1, and I have an annulus that is embedded inside of S3 times an interval that connects the two copies of the two knots. Examples of knots that are non trivial that are concordant to the unknot or the knot with zero crossing. And the smallest such example of such a knot has six crossings. And then there are many higher crossing number knots that are concordant to the unknot. And another advantage of considering knots up to concordance is that we get the appearance of a group structure. So the concordance group is defined to be the set of knots in S3 up to concordance. Where the group operation is connected sum 
and this is an abelian group under the connected sum operation. which looks as follows, I can take two knots K1 and K2, and their connected sum will be a new knot. Formed by deleting a small interval from each of the two knots and then joining them with two strands like so. So we can use homology cohortism invariance to construct concordance invariance. In other words, I can construct a concordance invariant of a knot by looking at a homology cohortism invariance of the surgery. So this idea was used in my thesis and published in 2019 to construct maps mu n from the concordance group to the integers. These maps come from not clear homology and they're not homomorphisms, but they give lower bounds on topological invariance, such as the unknotting number of a knot. So the unknotting number of a knot is the minimum number of crossing changes that I need to make in order to change my knot to a diagram for the unknot. And I take the minimum over all possible diagrams for my knot. The unknotted number is a notoriously difficult number to compute. Um, it's easy to compute an upper bound for the unknotted number given any diagram, um, but it's much harder to compute lower bounds for a knotting number. And basic questions such as whether the unknotting number is additive under a connected sum is still open. So it's very good to have more computable lower bounds on the unknotting number. For the second relationship between concordance and homology cohortism, uh, this is a less concrete relationship than the first one, but still a fruitful one for my research. So given a three manifold Y, we saw earlier that we could study its homology cohortism class by looking at the pair of this Hagrid fleur chain complex together with the map iota on CF minus. Given a knot in S3, we can look at a chain complex denoted by CFK which is called the Hager-Fleur chain complex of the knot 
and it's a chain complex over a two-variable polynomial ring over the field of two elements. And by studying this chain complex CFK, one can extract concordance information about the knot K. And there are some formal algebraic similarities in both invariants that exist that led us to the next theorem. So for every natural number j, there exists a surjective homomorphism bj from the concordance group to the integers. And these homomorphisms bj are analogous to the homology cohortism homomorphisms I mentioned earlier. By studying these homomorphisms on the concordance group, we are able to reprove theorems that the concordance group contains an infinite rank summon. So that's a theorem from the 1960s. We're able to also reprove that it contains that the subgroup of topologically sliced knots in the concordance group contains an infinite rank summon. So these are knots in the kernel of the smooth concordance group to the topological concordance group, where the smooth concordance group is not up to smooth concordance as I defined earlier. And the topological concordance group is where I consider knots up to a topological notion of concordance, where two knots are topologically concordant if there exists a locally flat annulus connecting them embedded in S3 times an interval. So knots in this subgroup are called topologically sliced. And in fact, this was a more recent theorem that it contains an infinite rank sum and proved in 2017 by Alshvaz, Dipschitz, and Sabo. And these homomorphisms Vj also give us new lower bounds on topological quantities such as the unknotting number. So if I look at the maximum j such that uj of my knot is non-zero, where I take zero if uj is equal to zero for all j, then this number is a lower bound for the minimum unknotting number over all knots k prime in the concordance class of my knot. In other words, this is the unknotting number up to concordance. It's the minimum unknotting number over all knots in the same concordance class as my knot. And the unknotting number is a very difficult number to compute lower bounds for. And the unknotting number up to concordance is also a difficult number to compute lower bounds for. So we're able to give computable lower bounds for this quantity. And using this theorem, we can produce the first family of knots whose unknotting number up to concordance rose arbitrarily large with respect to a different quantity called the four ball genus. So 
the third way I'll highlight a relationship between concordance and homology concordism is a future direction on studying a group that combines the notions of concordance and homology concordism into one group. So we can denote this group by theta 3c, and it's given the elements are pairs, y and k, where k is a knot in the three manifold y, and y is homology coordinate to S3. And we're going to mod out by an appropriate notion of concordance in this set, called homology concordance, where I say that two pairs y1, k1, and y2, k2 are homology concordant to each other if there exists a smoothly embedded annulus connecting k1 and k2 embedded inside some homology concordism between y1 and y2. So we would like to understand this group theta 3c and more specifically, we want to understand the quotients of this group by its subgroup of knots in S3 and ask how complicated of a group that quotient group is. Um, so what we know so far is that the quotient group theta 3C modulo the subgroup of knots in S3 contains a Z subgroup and that it's infinitely generated. These are results due to Heidelitzman, Genham, and Adam Levine. And we would like to further show that theta 3C modulo, that subgroup, contains a Z summand or even a Z infinity summand by carrying over some of the techniques that we used to study the concordance group and the homology concordism group and generate homomorphisms to the integers, we'd like to give surjective homomorphisms to the integers from this group that vanish for all knots in S3. So that's a future direction that combines concordance and homology concordism. And I'd like to end by Summarizing that my research, um, I aim to construct invariants using Fleur homology and Kabana homology and apply these invariants and machinery to study topological questions. Thank you.